Next, we're pleased to welcome Claire Manzetti, who is the Judy Conway Patton Endowed Chair in the Center for Research on Violence Against Women and also a professor and chair of the Department of Sociology at the University of Kentucky. She is a founding editor of the Sage Journal Violence Against Women and has, of course, authored and edited many other books and book chapters and articles on this subject. Um, her research into uh, violence against women has focused primarily on socially and economically marginalized women and more recently on the role of religiosity in the perpetration and victimization of violence as well as the you know, potential therapies that might, in some sense, remediate the consequences of that violence. We're very pleased to welcome Claire Renzetti. Thank you, John, and thank you all for being here this morning. I'm delighted to join you. I'm going to begin uh, by telling a little story. There's no international intrigue, um, <laughs> no CIA or anything. Um, it's a story I like to call, what if you start a journal and nobody submits a manuscript? Um, it's one of my favorite stories. It starts in <laughs> 1994. Um, Terry Hendricks, who was then an acquisitions editor at Sage, uh, invited me to edit a new journal that he was starting that was going to be called Violence Against Women. And when he asked me to do this, I was excited, and I was honored, and most of all, I was terrified. Um, because the question I kept asking myself was, what if we launch this journal and nobody submits any manuscripts? And I was even more afraid because the plan was to launch the journal eight months after we signed the contract. So I had to have a journal in print in about eight months, a journal issue. My worries, though, fortunately, were quickly proved unfounded, since within three years of publishing the first issue in 1995, we increased from quarterly publication to bimonthly publication. And by the fifth year, we were publishing monthly. And even though our acceptance rate has remained consistently low, and those of you who know journal publishing know that's a good thing. <laughs> you want it to be low. We have enough of a backlog to increase production even more. And next year, I'm hoping we'll go to 14 issues a year. So obviously, there is no shortage of outstanding research in the field of violence against women. And to some extent, this is a result of the passage of the Violence Against Women Act in 1994. VAWA mandated funding for research, especially research to evaluate and improve the criminal justice response to violence against women. In fact, between 1995 and 2012, which is the last year for which I have data, Congress appropriated nearly $70 million for research and evaluation in the area of violence against women. And much of this funding was awarded through and administered by the National Institute of Justice. So to say that this law and the research that has helped to fund have been impactful is truly an understatement. This research is not research to satisfy some idle academic curiosity. This is purpose-driven research. It is translational research. So I want you to consider some of the examples of this type of research and what it has addressed. Since the early years of the anti-violence against women movement in the 1970s, advocates and service providers have urged law enforcement and the courts to take violence against women seriously. And for many, this meant that police officers should arrest abusive intimate partners when they respond to a call for help instead of what they historically had done, which was to talk to the perpetrator, like do on-the-spot counseling, for instance, or to separate the partners for a period of time, and then they were back together at home. Using data from the Minneapolis domestic violence experiment and the subsequent spouse assault replication program, VAWA encouraged jurisdictions to favor arrest as a response to domestic violence. And so many jurisdictions adopted mandatory arrest or pro-arrest policies that required or strongly encouraged police to make an arrest when responding to a domestic violence call in the belief that this would make victims safer and it would also reduce recidivism. 
But continued research to evaluate these policies revealed that the police were sometimes arresting victims instead of abusers, or they would arrest both victims and abusers, which is a problem that's known as dual arrest. In their defense, the police maintained that they couldn't always determine who the abuser was when they were responding to a call. And if you think about this, it makes sense, right? Because the police are responding and they have to make a decision very, very quickly. And they're told you have to arrest if you're responding to a domestic violence call. And they get there and the partners are probably still fighting um, or it's still a very highly charged emotional scene. Um, the victim may have defended herself against the perpetrator and fought back. So what the police see is evidence that an assault occurred by both partners. And so they arrest both partners on the basis of that evidence. We also discovered that abusers became wise to mandatory arrests pretty quickly and would sometimes call the police before their partners did and claim that they had been assaulted. I was an expert witness on a case recently in which a woman had been arrested for stabbing her husband, but she had no recollection of doing this. And what had happened was he called the police while he was driving himself to the hospital, to the emergency room, and he said, my wife stabbed me. She's still at our house. I'm terrified of her. I'm going to the hospital for treatment. Please go to the house and arrest her. When the police got there, she was sort of befuddled and she wasn't quite sure what was going on. And, and as the case unfolded, it turned out that he had hit her on the head with the handle of a gun and she actually was unconscious for a while and then he stabbed himself. And I listened to the 911 call that he made and I looked at the photographs of his stab wounds and he really did a very bad job. Um, and, and, uh, and I said to the, the attorney for her, what you need is not really me. What you need is an expert in wounds and, and uh, infliction of wounds. And it was learned that he had stabbed himself um, and claimed that she had uh, assaulted him. So these problems of dual arrest and arrest of victims cause great concern among uh, researchers in the violence against women field. One concern was that victims, of course, could be discouraged from calling the police for fear of being arrested themselves, especially if they had defended themselves against an abuser. And uh, I had asked victims a number of, in a number of studies, you know, did you ever defend yourself against the abuse? And they would look at me like I was crazy and they would say, what would you do? Would you stand there and, and just allow this to happen to you? Of course I defend it myself. So it was very, very likely that the victim had in fact fought back. So these concerns became catalysts for additional research to imp again improve police responses. For instance, through training on how to identify the primary aggressor and distinguish this from self-defense. In addition, we studied how to establish specialized domestic violence units within police departments to include victim advocates when the police were responding to a call. And we evaluated the effectiveness of what's called a commu coordinated community response in which police and prosecutors, healthcare professionals, service providers, and victim advocates collaborate and work together to provide a multifaceted response to perpetrators, to victims and to their children. Another important area of investigation has been teen dating violence, with research focusing on the extent of the problem of violence in teen dating relationships, risk factors for teen dating violence, and evaluation of prevention and intervention programs specifically designed for teens, because these programs need to be age appropriate. These studies have shown, for example, that among the most significant risk factors are a five-year age gap between dating partners, the use of alcohol or drugs by one or both partners, and participation in other high-risk adolescent behaviors such as gang involvement. In addition, there's currently longitudinal research underway to examine if childhood bullying behavior evolves into sexual harassment and teen dating violence, and the factors that appear to contribute to this trajectory. And of course, a major focus of current research 
is the use of technology and social media to perpetrate sexual harassment and various forms of victimization, such as revenge pornography and uh, a by dating uh, partners or former dating partners. Research in the area of sexual violence has revealed the extent to which we previously underestimated the crime of sexual violence. By simply changing the wording of one question from, have you ever been raped, which very few people wanted to admit, or didn't know what had happened to them was rape, to, has anyone ever forced you to have sex when you didn't want to, we learned that one in seven women have been raped in their lifetime, not the one in 20, as previously thought, but that only about 15 to 20 percent of rape victims report their crime to law enforcement. We've also learned that having sexual assault nurse examiners, or what we call SANES, available in emergency rooms improves evidence collection and results in more positive outcomes for sexual assault victims and the jurisdictions that have included SANES on sexual assault response teams, or SARTs, see higher victim participa participation in the criminal justice process, and therefore better conviction rates, as well as positive outcomes for victims. Most recently, researchers, practitioners, advocates, and policymakers came together on the White House Task Force to Protect Students from Sexual Assault. And Congress is currently considering passage of the Bipartisan Campus Accountability and Safety Act, which among, among other mandates requires universities to conduct annual surveys of their students regarding their experiences of sexual violence on campus. Clearly, the violence against women field is one in which there is a strong synergistic relationship between practitioners, policymakers and researchers. VAWA certainly contributed to the development of this relationship, but it's really important not to forget that researchers and practitioners worked together tirelessly for the passage of VAWA and have continued to lobby for reforms with every reauthorization of that law and currently as Congress deliberates the merits of the Campus Accountability and Safety Act. But the reach of this relationship goes beyond our national borders. Violence against women research, service, advocacy, and public policy are global in scope. Human trafficking, female genital mutilation, honor killing, dowry murders, and child marriage, in addition to intimate partner violence and sexual assault, are receiving increasing attention in countries throughout the world, including in the lawmaking bodies of these countries. Again, because of collaborations between researchers, service providers, and advocates. And equally important, these collaborations are interdisciplinary. I don't know of many problems that we could address effectively if we only look at it from one discipline or through the lens of one perspective. We learned early on in the violence against women field that to, to develop effective responses to this multi-dimensional problem requires an interdisciplinary approach. So in the journal Violence Against Women, you're gonna find research by sociologists and criminologists and psychologists and social workers, all the usual suspects, all the disciplines that you'd expect. But you're also gonna find research by nurses and public health professionals, by economists, and by communications and media specialists. So it's hardly surprising that the subtitle of the journal Violence Against Women is an international and interdisciplinary journal. The journal is now in its 21st year of publication, and as the founding editor, it feels good to look back and see how far we've come in this field in just two decades, and to know that the work that we've published has made a contribution to these achievements. But we are very far from success, if by success we mean that women throughout the world are able to live their lives free of fear of being victimized by gender-based violence. I can tell you that none of us are patting each other on the back at this point because we still have a long way to go. But nevertheless, we're heartened by the progress that's been made. And so on behalf of the researchers, practitioners, and advocates who have published their work in Violence Against Women, 
I really have to take this opportunity to express our gratitude to Sarah Miller McCune and to Sage Publications for the leadership role they've taken in the dissemination of groundbreaking, cutting edge research that has informed and in many cases transformed public policy on gender-based violence in the United States and throughout the world. So congratulations on your 50th anniversary and best wishes for continued success over the next 50 years. I probably shouldn't say this, but hopefully by then my journal will be out of business. Um, or better yet, we'll have changed the title to something like Women Living Safely and Fearlessly, an international and interdisciplinary journal. Thank you.